morning. Welcome to Politics and Eggs, New Hampshire's premier breakfast and lunch event for politics, for those campaigning, for those who talk about campaigns, and today for those who talk about Washington. This is uh, a collaboration between the New England Council and the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at San Anselm College. Um, as many of you know, this this breakfast series was started a long time ago by Mr. Mr. New Hampshire Fred Coker, who's here in the front. Um, before we get started, I want to recognize the fact that our sponsors are all here on the wall. And uh, if you've ever hung those banners, you know how hard it is, so please recognize them. <laughs> um, Usually we go around and we do VIPs. I just wanted to make a quick uh, reference to one person, I think, the VIP here, who is uh, what, what really the New Hampshire Institute of Politics is all about. And, uh, we have John Pearson, who's right here. He's a student at St. Nelson College. You'll see him quite a bit. He's uh, basically helps run the institute as a student ambassador. Um, does most of the early morning shots for the people like Senator Ayotte, Senator Shaheen. Um, Senator Collins has a, for two summers running around in the state of Maine for her. Um, and I just wanted to recognize him because he's really uh, the next face for us and what the Institute of Politics is all about. Um, I hope many of you got a chance to meet Dr. Stephen DeSalvo, our new president, who was here earlier. Um, he's got us running around. I might look a little tired. Um, and uh, if you didn't meet him, you'll get a chance. He's almost at every single event now. So, um, I want to recognize and welcome up to the podium Jim Brett, who's the President and CEO of the New England Council. Um, on October 16th, we have the big New England Council dinner, which is really New England's premier event. We're all looking forward to it in Boston. Um, and so for purposes of introduction, I want to recognize Jim Brett. Wearing green ties. Oh, <laughs> Neil says he's running around right. The new president. It's about time he does some work. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to say good morning and uh, I want to thank all of you for starting your day here at our Politics and Age series. As uh, Neil said, it's a relationship with the council and St. Age has had for many years. Obviously, it's a uh, great relationship. And uh, look forward to many more years of this relationship. Uh, in addition to today's uh, forum, I just thought I'd give you a, a quick uh, summary of some of our upcoming New England Council events. And hopefully, many of you will participate next week, September 27th. We'll have another respected journalist and uh, best selling author, Jonathan Alton, <clears throat> for a uh, luncheon here, BBI. We'll be back here on uh, October 7th with uh, New York Congressman Peter Lynch. I mean, Peter King, <laughs> Peter Lynch. I have a call into Peter Lynch this morning. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I have a call into him for a uh, As many of you know, he's considering a run for president. October 9th, uh, Alex Castanaro, founder of Purple Strategy. I guess we'll be speaking here in New Hampshire. Uh, we have a new series in Washington, D.C. called Capital Conversation. So we have the members of Congress from New England and the Senators from New England speak in their districts and their states here. But we also have them speak in Washington for our members who have some type of representation in Washington. It gives them an opportunity to have some face time to listen to the Congressmen and the Senators. And we have upcoming in the next couple of weeks, Congressman Richie Neal will be speaking, Senator Angus King will be speaking, and Senator Chris Murphy. We'll be speaking to the New England Council in our new capital conversation, which is terrific. Uh, in fact, next week we will be in Washington for a, a forum on cybersecurity, and Senator uh, Sheldon Whitehouse uh, from Rhode Island will be our keynote uh, speaker. And on November 6th, we in Boston are going to host uh, five of the Region 1 administrators, the EPA, and, uh, Health, Health and Human Services, and Housing, get all five together on a panel. And we've done this in the past, and, and people find it very, very helpful. Because it's nice to know 
connect the face with the name. So we hope that many of you will participate. On November 7, uh, this was uh, put together a while ago, but we have a Massachusetts Attorney General, Martha Coakley, who will be speaking. Uh, and then we all know she just announced her uh, gubernatorial candidacy. And as Neil was kind enough to mention, the October 16th dinner. And uh, this dinner, right now, we've sold, I think, 145 tables. So we're, we're probably going to have between 1,500 and 1,600 people at this dinner. And it sets an awful lot of new in the council and the support that all of our members give. I mean, it's probably the largest event that, that Boston has. And it's all in New England. And there's very few groups that can do that. And uh, we just want to thank you. One of our recipients is the Mr. Junior Senator here, Kelly Ayla, and uh, many of you have been generous in your support of this dinner. Just want to say thank you. Um, now, the reason why we're here to introduce <coughs> in front of Peter Lynch is uh, top name political journalist, Mike Lidovich. He is the national correspondent for New York Times Magazine. We all know about him. Uh, and he's a Boston guy. He's still a Red Sox fan. Uh, I'll just say, uh, for full disclosure, 20 years ago this year, I was a candidate for mayor of this great city of Boston. Mark worked for one of the leading newspapers of Boston that nobody read. <laughs> and I was the Boston Phoenix. They did not endorse me for mayor. That's okay. That's all right. <laughs> I, I am around. Boston Phoenix, not. Uh, but he, he, is, uh, he is a very good man. Uh, he has uh, held positions in San Jose Mercury News, the Washington Post. He spent nine years. Uh, he joined the New York Times in 2006. And uh, the rest is history. He's, he's won awards, the National uh, Magazine Award, was profiled by Portico Mike Allen. Um, needless to say, why he is here is, is, is the book. And uh, I have several books over here for you to sign too. But this book, if you're a political junkie, and I think we all are, this is a must read. It's a fabulous, fabulous book. And uh, somebody was complaining there's no pictures. Well, too bad. <laughs> it's a great book. And uh, what is going on in, in Washington. And uh, I think, it, as Washington Post described it, hottest political book of the summer. No doubt about it. The arm of some of them. It is really a, it's just a very, very well written book. So if you haven't had a chance to read the book, I suggest you purchase the book uh, today. I truly believe you will not regret it. We're delighted that uh, Mark took some time out of his busy schedule to offer his insights on Washington upcoming election season. If you read the book, I think he was, I think it's in the book that he said that he was, he was able to pick the VP for 2012. He said in the book that uh, it would be Joe Biden. So uh, that's pretty good. That he was selected in 2008. I don't know. But we'll talk about it yet. Please join me in welcome a warm New England, New Hampshire welcome to the most distinguished journalist of Washington, D.C., Mark Lee. Thanks, Jim. Um, now, because no one read The Phoenix, you didn't, you didn't know that we actually did endorse him. And, um, yeah, The Phoenix went downhill as soon as I left. That's, that's like the great journalism trope. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is, um, first of all, I want to personally thank all the men here who are not wearing ties. Because any time a reporter goes out in public and is on this side of the podium, you just don't know what he or she could be wearing. So this is a relief to me. Um, there are two things that reporters feel very, very passionately about. One is free food. We're, we're very, very pro-free food. Uh, one, another thing is just something fills us with terror, and that's the word featured speaker. Uh, I'm used to being on this side of the wooden egg, and I'm very, very pleased to say that I have been on this side of the wooden egg. I've been an alumnus of politics and eggs breakfast. Uh, I've been coming to New Hampshire for years. I love coming to New Hampshire. And it's weird to be a guy not carrying a notebook. It's weird to be a guy who's not asking the questions. Um, so but one thing I will say is, in the speeches I've given about the book, and I hate the word speeches, but in the talks I've been giving about the book, what I've truly enjoyed most of all is the give and take. So 
I would encourage all of you when the time comes, or even before the time comes, to raise your hands or interrupt me, because I, I just love these things to be as interactive as possible. Um, so I've been coming to New Hampshire for years, and I do think that having grown up in Massachusetts, the New Hampshire primary arguably is the thing that made me a political junkie. Uh, you don't grow up within media range in New Hampshire, and local media was a much bigger deal back then, without catching the bug and without knowing that the New Hampshire primary is the thing. And I remember, uh, the first primary I remember was 1976, and waking up one day, and we always used to listen to WRKO, which was the AM pop music station that the kids used to listen to. I mean, who would think that, I guess I'm old, but there was a pop music station on AM that everyone listened to. And they had the news in the morning, and I remember Bill Rossi was the name of the guy who did the news at the top of the hour, and he came in one day and said, Jimmy Carter wins the New Hampshire primary. And I had this sort of blurry idea of there was this pack of Democrats who were running, and uh, then he won. I'm like, oh, so I guess he's the guy. And so I started paying attention to Jimmy Carter. And all of a sudden, you just sort of saw this thing built every four years. And I became completely addicted. And even when I wasn't covering politics, I always been able to wait to come up to cover the primary when I started to become a reporter. I guess I started coming here in 92, I was here in 96. I think I skipped 2000. And then as a full-time political reporter, um, I started coming up here in 04, 08, and I, I just love the early states. I love Iowa. I love New Hampshire. <clears throat> you spend, like, usually how it works for us is you spend two weeks in Iowa, then the last maybe 10 days in New Hampshire. And in Iowa, you get used to these, I mean, really nice people out there. And it's like, hey, you going to that next event in Davenport? I'm like, yeah, I might. So uh, we're not be speaking, what time? I'm like, oh, 8 o'clock, well, where is Davenport? Like, oh, it's about three hours away. I'm like, oh, okay, so I'm not going to that event. And then you go, so, but the next one in Council Bluffs you could catch, but where's Council Bluffs? Oh, it's about five hours this way. Then you get to New Hampshire, and everything is 20 minutes away. Uh, except um, for Berlin, which is, which actually, one tribute, Jack Dermon, who was always extremely nice to me, who was this legend who just passed away a few weeks ago, had something called the Jermon Rule, which is that you would never, ever travel, a reporter would never, ever travel to Berlin to see a candidate who was under 15% in the polls. And this was widely invoked at a early morning event in Berlin for John Huntsman back in January that about 12 reporters were uh, sitting in the back of the room for, and we all at that moment invoked the German rule. So uh, I'm worried that there's a generation of people who won't understand what the German rule is. And uh, of course, you wonder why were the 12 people up watching John Huntsman early in the morning? It's actually a Saturday. But anyway, it, it's great to be here. It is, um, it's been an amazing <coughs> summer to uh, to say the least for me. I mean, this book seems to have gotten more traction than I ever could have hoped. And what's been interesting about it is to see the disconnect in the reaction from inside Washington to outside Washington. Essentially, this book is called This Town, as you all know, or hopefully some of you know. Um, it, it's essentially a profile of the city, of the capital city over the last five years. And I wanted people to know exactly what Washington has become. And I think people have a sense that Washington isn't working. People around the country have a sense that Washington is dysfunctional, that it's divided. But really, it's a pretty abstract notion outside. And I wanted to sort of show in the full kind of carnival of what has become this big and wealthy and decadent place in which nothing is getting done except for the people who are on the inside. So one of the things I want, so, so people ask me a lot, what made me write the book? Or what was the moment where I decided that there was a book here? And the moment was sitting at the memorial service for Tim Russert at the Kennedy Center in June of 2008. And it was this moment right at the dawn of this historic presidential election. The economy was about to crash. Um, you had McCain and Obama about to go against each other. You had the, the, the Twitter was about to really sort of take off, and the internet was really, really revolutionary, really revolutionizing reporting. And just sitting in the Kennedy Center and seeing everyone there, the Clintons, the Obamas, the McCains, the lobbyists, 
the Democrats, the Republicans, the media fancies, and watching the thing devolve into a cocktail party and watching people throwing business cards around at a funeral and watching people preening and trying to angle themselves to get interviews <coughs> with the soon-to-be nominees of both parties and people running up to Hillary Clinton and saying, would you like to be on Countdown on MSNBC tonight? And just sort of watching this thing happen right in front of me, this is a tragic event for, for all of us, and deciding at that moment that I think Washington had reached a tipping point of self-celebration at a time when the rest of the country was really hungry for change um, and very, very hungry for, or very, very disgusted with what was going on in Washington. So uh, from there, I just sort of jumped off and spent the next five years cataloging the full carnival that you see on TV. And this, so I've been, there's been a lot of anticipation about the book inside of Washington. And then the book comes out, and I was sort of expecting this big waterfall, and everyone was like, boy, he's going to be scrutinized, or he'll never be lunch in this town again. Will anyone ever talk to him, because he's naming names, and he's talking about um, you know, a lot of the self-dealing that we know goes on. And all of a sudden, um, it sort of came out, and people started reading it. And it's been this amazing sort of thing to watch, because inside of town, everyone's focusing on who wins, who loses. You know, who will talk to this guy again? But outside of town, there's been this really, really great, I think, discussion that I've seen that I've never experienced before about how it got this way, how Washington can work better, what we can do as citizens to maybe change things, and how we can engage people in a healthy way. And so this has been an amazing thing to, to watch and to experience. And there's an anecdote towards the end of the book <clears throat> in which President Obama, maybe around late 2011, is very, very upset with the coordination between his White House and his then fledgling campaign in Chicago. And they had just taken a meeting on the debt ceiling crisis, and he was very, very upset. And he wanted everyone to meet every Saturday in the road of the White House to coordinate strategy and to really everyone got on the same page. And in the first meeting, the president said, look, there are 15 of us in here. We've all known each other for a long time. I want this meeting to be one in which we recapture the trust, the openness that we had in 2008 when we were running for president. It was a small group. I feel like we communicated better. And this is what I want to do. I want to meet every week. I want to sort of have it out. I want to talk about strategy. And so they had these four or five meetings every Saturday in the Roosevelt Room. They had about a half dozen people flying from Chicago. And the president, it was a Saturday morning, the president said, look, here are five issues that I wish I'd been more vocal about in the first term. And he wrote climate change, he wrote Guantanamo, he wrote gay marriage, he wrote immigration, and a couple others. He wrote it on a yellow sheet of paper, a yellow legal pen. And a couple days later, Jim Messina, the campaign manager, gets a call from, I think it was Mark Halpern, it was one of the two game change authors. And it was clear that this had leaked. And the president was informed, and Jim Messina called the president, told him this. And everyone knew that the president was pissed. Or, can you say pissed in politics? <laughs> I'm okay, sorry, was, was upset. Was, was displeased. And he uh, led off the next meeting. Everyone was sort of dreading what he was going to say. He led off the next meeting by saying, look, guys, I trusted you. What happened? You know, This is like not OK. And these have been great meetings. I think these have been some of the greatest meetings we've had since I've been president. And I hope they will continue on a regular basis in some way. And if they do, it'll be without me. He gets up, storms away, leaves. Vice President Biden who is left behind, who chews everyone out. He said, guys, you let him down. What's going on here? Biden leaves. And there's this big soul-searching meeting sort of that, that remains. And people are yelling at each other and accusing each other of being the leakers and everything. And it sort of became what happened to us. It became what happened to this change brigade. Because you know, you'll remember people invested a lot of hope and people in both parties really thought that this was going to be the movement that sort of brings a new culture to this world. And um, 
things were getting pretty heated, pretty profane, and Robert Gibbs, the press secretary for the first couple of years, steps up and says, look guys, what happened to us? I have a question. Did we change Washington or did Washington change us? And that question sort of runs through the narrative of this book. And the larger point is what a huge, powerful, unchangeable, or sort of immovable culture can do to a person. People sort of have always asked me, all right, who comes off worse in the book? Who do you, who do you not like the most? Because it's a, it looks like a really cynical book, and it is a really cynical book. And I was like, well, I don't want to pick on any one person or institution or party. I, I, this is a profile of the whole machine and the power it has to change people, to have people work in a certain way, to have people interact in a certain way. And, and essentially, it's about how Washington has been transformed from a city of public service to one in which self-service has sort of taken over as the, the defining ethic. And it's because, partly because there's never been more money in the political system. There's never been more, I mean, the, the local economy is, in Washington has not hiccuped at all at a time when the rest of the country has struggled economically. Um, I mean, government's grown for, for you know, about 10, 15 years now. When government grows, all these entities around government grow, like lobbying and consulting and so forth. Uh, new media has revolutionized everything, it's sort of given everyone a face and everyone a platform. And so I want to sort of chart that growth. And, and it's funny, I did a really, really great event at San Anselm last night um, at uh, the Institute of Politics, New Hampshire Institute of Politics. And Pat Griffin was moderating, he was asking me questions. And first question he asked me, which is, I mean, you've been around, I've been around the country this summer and I've been, um, I, I thought I'd asked everything. You know, you sort of, like, you sort of know what it's like to be a politician now. You sort of get the same questions, you have your answer and everything. And his first question to me was, so are you a cynic? And that was a great question because I haven't been asked that. I'm partial to any question I haven't been asked. But it was sort of jarring, and I sort of said, um, I said, yeah, I guess I am. And you don't work as a reporter in Washington for as long as I have without being a cynic, because you're talked to in a certain way. You're, frankly, it's the language of obsequiousness. It's the language of, of spin. It's the language you know, of sucking up in some, in some ways. And these are not how most people deal with each other. Um, but then I said, but I'm not a cynic because I do think that this book comes from a place of idealism. You know, it comes from a place of someone who's raising his kids in D.C., who every morning sees his kids sort of watch the vice president's motorcade pass by, whether it's Cheney or Biden or whoever, and just sort of stand in wonder of this sort of incredible amount of history that's unfolding in our hometown. And also, just sort of, there's so much history and so much you know, monuments and things. You can, you've got a sense of what it's like to be someone standing in wonderment of this great country and this great city that has just gone so terribly uh, awry. So I wanted to do better. Um, I guess I'm speaking as a citizen, and this is when I take off my cynical journalism hat. And um, I mean, I don't, people always also say, so what solutions would you give? And you know, this book does not have the clean chapter at the end in which I lay out the 10 bullet points, how we can fix our government, or how we can you know, make the capital city work better. Um, you know, look, I'm a reporter. I, I hold a mirror to a culture. Uh, reporters are, are my people. Um, Dan Balls, is, is Dan actually sitting in the mirror? So he's talking about Dan Balls, who is um, one of my idols, my longtime coworker at the Washington Post. Everyone should read his book, by the way, on the last campaign called Collision 2012. It's one of the best campaign books I have ever read, I mean, of any campaign. Uh, I just got finished with it a few weeks ago. Um, so there's a plug for Dan's book, and for Dan in general. But, no, but I do think that what this book has opened my eyes to is the power of discussion, um, maybe the power of outrage, and then the inevitable next question about this is where is it all going to lead? What does it mean for 2016? And I do think, and maybe this is just my own experience and I've been just to inhabiting my own reality this summer, but I do think that there is an incredible vulnerability that any candidate who is associated with the status quo could face. I mean, people think, you know, well, Hillary Clinton is inevitable for, you know, on the Democratic side. I do think that 
as soon as, if she runs for president, as soon as she starts behaving politically again, people are going to automatically just sort of click on to like, okay, this again. And I think the words this again are very, very dangerous in politics right now. I mean, I think there's incredible hungering for something new, something not of Washington, and something just not of the same old movie we have seen over and over and over again. For how qualified Hillary Clinton might be, I think if there's a Democrat who can definitely present him or herself as an outsider, as another change agent, um, she could be very, very vulnerable. On the Republican side, as a reporter, I am just completely excited to watch this thing unfold. I mean, it, it is really, I mean, you hear about the battle for the heart and soul of X party, but I mean, this is, I just think all the rules are, are out. I mean, I think, you know, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Boomlets, if there were Boomlets this earlier, are fascinating to watch. I think they're real. I think they're both very, very talented and compelling politicians. I think Chris Christie is a very, very talented and compelling uh, politician. Marco Rubio, Paul Ryan, Jeb Bush. I mean, I, I would just love to, I, as a pure political junkie, I'm really excited to watch this thing play out. But um, <clears throat> again, my experience, though, as someone who has watched Washington and who has watched politics go from being, I think, I, I, I think the internet, I mean, I, I can talk more about this if you, want to, if you want to go there, but I do think that the internet has created this anarchy in the peanut gallery we have now, in which we don't really know what's important, and memories have never been shorter, and it's never been easier to have a next act or a platform or an easy, you know, easy wealth, or just some kind of easy play that makes it very, 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 very easy to come into politics now, partly just to get rich. I mean, people, when I was a kid, did not get into politics to get rich. I mean, this is a whole new ball game because there's just, again, so much money in the system. Um, it has, I think, changed the game quite a bit. So, I, I think what I'd say before we get to questions is, why did I do this? I mean, that's like the, the other most common question is why on earth would I? And, and if you haven't read the book, or if you haven't heard about the book, it essentially it's been described as a tell-all. It's been described as a takedown. Um, people seem to be entertained by it. That's good. But I also think people have been, you know, awakened, especially outside of town, to what it looks like. And they say, why would you do this? I mean, you you're a, you're an insider. You live in Washington. You work for a major news organization. You are someone who is on the inside, and I mean, you, you have a good job. Um, you seem to be fairly well respected, I guess. Uh, that was that was before. And um, but why why do you want to blow this thing up? And I'm like, well, I'm not blowing anything up. But I do think that if this book has made some people uncomfortable, which it undoubtedly has, inside of Washington. Um, I welcome that because I think Washington, above all, has become an incredibly comfortable place. It is a very, very comfortable place to practice journalism in, and I said that speaking as a journalist. And I think it's important for anyone, no matter what you do in life, no matter how, how old you are, to periodically shake things up, periodically make yourself uncomfortable, make people, maybe in a world that <coughs> thrives on the status quo, uncomfortable. And look, I don't have the luxury of writing this book as a foreign correspondent. I live there, I'm raising my kids there. Uh, I know these people, I go to work with these people, I go to parties with these people, at least I used to. Uh, <laughs> I kind of still invited. No, I actually still, I'm still invited to these parties, I think. He said, he said it all the way in New Hampshire. But, um, but if nothing else, I think it's important to start a conversation. I think that's what the book has done. Um, and it's been a really crazy experience for me because I was in Detroit yesterday, New Hampshire today, Tallahassee tomorrow to talk to some, I mean this is, again, I'm not a guy at the podium. <laughs> I'm a guy who is on that side. But it's been great because I, I do think that when you say things that, that might be unpopular, that might be controversial, maybe you get people's attention, but I think, frankly, discomfort is something I, I invite very much, especially in politics, especially in Washington, especially 
now as things stand. So um, that is, I guess that concludes what passes for my, um, my planned remarks, but I would love to take your questions um, for as long as you got them. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Steve Green Open Leadership New Hampshire. Going back to the beginning of your remarks, uh, one of the things that we take pride in in New Hampshire is, is the retail politics and the opportunity we have that many other states don't of ordinary people sitting down with politicians or candidates rather and asking them often difficult questions, questions that are discomforting. But I think that that's changing and technology is, is obviously a major factor in that. And I think back to the incident that Governor Romney had at Chez Vachon when he sat down next to a, a veteran and thought that he would have a conversation and it turned out to be a very different kind of conversation that immediately went viral. And one can only imagine what his campaign staff back in Washington or wherever they were said to themselves when they saw this and thought, oh God, how do we figure this out now? Do you think that the ubiquity of technology, the instantaneousness with which it can report even the, the, the slightest flaw or, or, or ill-made the mark is going to change that retail politics and people will be more scripted and less likely to get engaged in just the kind of exchange that we take pride here in the state. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, first of all, I mean, technology has been changing the nation of that, the, the notion of that transaction for years. I mean, Ed Muskie, I mean, I guess, was it television? I guess, was that, was that caught on television? I guess it was the, the, the illusion that he cried, the notion of him crying was, was captured. But look, for years you have been seeing candidates going to Sheba Sean, literally talking to three or four voters while maybe 25 reporters with boom mics cover them. So essentially, New Hampshire for many years has been a soundstage for these kinds of encounters, Iowa too. I mean, it's the media culture we live in. Um, having said that, the incident you described and the incident that goes up, incidents like that that happen all the time in, in such things are completely unplanned. I mean, the candidate is, I mean, quite often you'll have an advanced team pick out four or five safe tables for candidate X to go visit. But look, when you are in this environment, those things will happen. I don't care how, how scripted you are or not. Um, I also think that this country especially like something like New Hampshire, especially, maybe more than Iowa, is incredibly ripe for a completely unplugged candidate. I mean, one of the greatest campaigns, well, storied campaigns, certainly in my recent memory, was the McCain 2000 campaign. He didn't win, but his big thing was straight talk. You know, and everyone claims to be like the last honest man in politics. Like, I'm gonna tell you what I think, you know, the buck stops here. And that, that's been a pretty well honed pose in politics for a while, but I mean, John McCain spent hours, hours, just like talking about anything. I mean, for uh, just not really caring. Um, the media loved him. I mean, granted, you know, I'm a media guy. We, we always are partial to this. But then he runs again in 2008, and he was pretty nostalgic. He was like, well, why can't we just do that again? And, you know, Twitter made that impossible. I mean, if, t if Twitter were there in 2000, I mean, Every time John McCain said something perhaps inelegant or slightly offensive, which was probably once every 10 minutes, um, it would be out on Twitter and there'd be, I mean, there'd be no, no one would pay attention to anything else. I, I do think if I, were, if I were running for president, which I'm not, I mean, literally, I would just say, all right, whatever. <laughs> if you want to tweet what I say, I mean, I just think that people appreciate that. I mean, Yes, the media could declare it blunder like five times a day and just sort of go through it. And look, I mean, people want human beings. So I hope that continues. I mean, I think Mitt Romney and Barack Obama were both extremely cautious in putting themselves in those environments. I think Hillary Clinton was in 2008. I think John McCain was in 2008. In fact, the best story I worked on in 2008 was John McCain when he didn't give a damn. This was my... Remember, he, was, he almost dropped out in the summer of 2007. I, I joined him on a bus trip through South Carolina, and it was, he just didn't care. He was just telling stupid Henny Youngman jokes, which I loved, and I just sort of made a whole piece about him and his Henny Youngman jokes. 
And it was just sort of depressing, and this was kind of a little bit in the first chapter of the book, or first couple chapters of the book, seeing John McCain's metamorphosis into uh, a straight-jacketed you know, establishment you know, nominee, which is demanded of, of candidates who are going to be the nominee. But I hope it continues. I, I think it will. Um, I hope New Hampshire fights really, really hard to keep its, its first in the nation status. I think that will continue, whether it's staged or not. There are unpredictable things that will happen, and, and you learn a lot of more predictable environments. Were they in 2008? And 
I think that they were sincere. But if you look at the people around him, I mean, these are all political lifers, pretty much. I mean, these are people, many of whom lived in Washington and worked in Washington, and they fashioned a very compelling anti-Washington, anti-status quo message. Um, and I think, I don't know what's in the president's mind, I, mean, I think he was sincere. I think it certainly resonated. I think they ran a really, really smart and, and you know, obviously effective campaign in 2008. But look, it's so much easier to talk about change in a, in a campaign environment than it is in a government environment. I mean, I wouldn't want to go up against a Congress like the current majority, and I don't think I'd want to go against a Congress when the Democrats are in the majority. And I remember, I mean, people talk about, you know, the Republicans now are just so intractable. I mean, who, what president could deal with this Congress? I remember when I first joined the Times in 2006, we had an interview, me and my colleague Carl Hulse, with uh, Nancy Pelosi, and it just then looked like the Democrats could actually reclaim the House after 12 years in the wilderness. And she was boasting about Social Security. As soon as President Bush, he'd just been reelected in 2004, as soon as he started talking about Social Security, I met with Harry Reid, and we said, mm, he's going after Social Security. We're just not going to give him anything. No matter what we do, we're just going to work 24 7, well, we're not fundraising, to keep our caucuses together, and we're just going to get in the way of this. I don't care what he says, we're not going to talk about it, we're not going to offer solutions. And, I mean, forget, I don't want to get into Social Security politics, God knows, but I remember sitting there, and she was, she was talking about this very unabashedly, and I think, okay, so you basically said that you spent your next two years after the president's election to just do anything you possibly can to deny him any kind of victory in Social Security because you knew that this was a good Democratic issue. You didn't want to help him. And then Barack Obama gets elected, fast forward, and one of the first things Mitch McConnell says is we're going to do everything in our power to... Um, to defeat Barack Obama and make him a one-term president. So you know where they're coming from. So, man, I don't know. I mean, there's a long answer here, but I, I do think that you, I think that is just such a big job. I think to come into Washington and to try to change it is a great talking point. It's just a very, 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 very big order, and, and I don't, you know, I don't think anyone's really prepared for it. CNN was on the phone with him saying, hey, 
we're looking for new Republican strategists. I mean, anyone can call himself a strategist now, right? Uh, only, only strategist I know is Tom Rath. Tom is a strategist. <laughs> um, but he said, no, we're doing a show on the birthers and whether President Obama was actually born in the United States. And we're looking for a you know, young Republican voice, and you know, we saw your picture, and you've been in the news, we'd love to have you come on. And this is CNN, like the most trusted name in broadcasting, whatever they're calling themselves, they're calling themselves in. Um, so they did a pre-interview, and it was all going to happen, and then all of a sudden some other news broke, so they bumped in, but they agreed to keep in touch. And um, anyway, I mean, that's a window into what my business has become, and I think it extends certainly to, to politics. Maybe one more question, though. Yeah, yeah. I'll take two. Okay. Yeah, go with you and you two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure you want to answer this question. The question on leaks. Now, does that they usually come from someone who is on the inside as a cause, or does the reporter develop people inside? Both. Yeah, it's a great question. I love questions like that. No, I mean, reporters basically create their own mistakes, right? I mean, I think the nature of, I mean, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein were the hardest working guys in show business in 1972 and three and four. Uh, they were outsiders then, by the way. They're insiders now, but, but no one knew who they were. They were anonymous Metro reporters. But they worked and they worked and they worked. I mean, there's a whole movie to, look to how hard they worked. And, and they were in a position to receive leaks from, from people that enabled them to write the biggest story in, in the history of journalism. Um, so it's both, but I mean, sometimes things just fall in your lap. So. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Yeah. I'm just going to ask you real quick. Is, given the listening to the book, so I, I listen to the so book. It's not my voice. I hope that's not a person. I don't care. No, no, I'm thrilled to have anyone listen and read, you know, have it thrown at them, whatever. As long as you buy <laughs> I was struck by the, the almost sociopathic narcissism that exists within our present culture. Uh, and to that end, you, you mentioned several times uh, that you know, you're not invited to parties or you're on the outskirts. So doesn't a book like this almost actually feed into the narcissism? Sure, it could. Every person mentioned knows exactly what page they're on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> the first interview I did for this book was, actually the second interview, was, uh, I was on George Stephanopoulos' show. This, it came out on Tuesday, it was supposed to come out on Tuesday, it was July 16th, and the 14th I did Stephanopoulos' show. I'm sitting in the green room, and um, Tom Cole of Oklahoma comes in, a Republican from Oklahoma, a smart guy. Amy Klobuchar, a senator, Democratic senator from Minnesota, walks in. <laughs> Klobuchar says, didn't read your book, but I see that I'm on page 214. Um, and one thing about the book is it doesn't include an index. And one of the reasons they didn't put an index in there is because there's this Washington tradition called the Washington Read, where people walk into a bookstore, go immediately to the index, see if their names are in there. And if they're not, or if they're mentioned just in passing, they'll shove the book right back on the shelf and won't bother buying it. Uh, Richard Ben Kramer, uh, who wrote What It Takes, you know, took this approach, and, and I decided in tribute to him, he died earlier this year. <laughs> and I would do this too, but it was pretty smart. But no, but the Washington Post then, of course, two days later, prints an unauthorized index online, so people like Amy Klobuchar can come up to me and say, hey, I saw you mention me. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think I was me. And I'm trying to think, when did I mention Amy Klobuchar in the book? Because, you know, there's like 800, 900 people in the book. Anyone here mentioned, Mike Causey was mentioned in the book. Should I tell you why? No. No. Mike Causey, uh, who I don't think I ever met before this morning, sees his name on in the index, and uh, yeah, he was a uh, New Hampshire field director, or political director for Barack Obama's 2008 campaign. He organized, I guess, a dinner with activists, went on for hours, great conversation, everyone really connected. Uh, no one endorsed then Senator Obama. Then Senator Obama's walking out to his car with Mike and says, God, what do I have to do? Wash their cars or something? So, um, anyway, no, but I think, yeah, he could. I mean, look, I actually have gotten more people mad at me for not mentioning them in the book than I did for mentioning them in the book, which I think tells you all you need to know right there. Uh, so it's sort of a, a victory for the as long as you spell the name right school, which is kind of depressing, but whatever. Um, so 
but most of what I'm asking me out. This has been great. Thanks for uh, having me up here.